Thank you very much, Mark, for that, that kind introduction. Thank you for the ability to, to come to this conference. I don't think I've been to a lot of conferences. I don't think I've ever been to one where a sociologist was quoted and I and I follow a lawyer. Um, so I'm hoping uh, to continue in the, in the guise of these excellent presentations and tell you uh, about my day job. So when I talk to any number of groups, uh, I say without any sense of irony that I have the best job in the universe. I get up every morning, and I go into work, and I work on building a machine to see the beginning of time. And that's quite literally what we're going to do with this mission. The primary science goal is to see the, what, what the astronomers call the end of the dark ages. Those of us that are from our positive thinking would think of it as first light in the universe. This is after the Big Bang, the hot primordial hydrogen is ionized. After about 400,000 years, it cools together to make neutral hydrogen. There are no stars. There are no galaxies. The universe is kind of an uninteresting place. About 400 million years after that event, there's enough gravitational attraction for stars to begin. We're going to be able to see back to that, to that epoch and actually localize that epoch in time, which will tell us a tremendous amount about the universe. Because we can see all the way back to the infancy of the universe, we're going to be able to see it develop and grow. So we're going to be able to track the assembly of galaxies, the distribution of, and production of the heavy elements that make us up, make up our own planet, make up all the products that we've been talking about uh, today, and essentially describe the evolution of what's called the Hubble sequence, or what does the universe look like today. Inside our galaxy, we're going to be able to peer into protostellar and protoplanetary nebulas to see the origin of stars and planets. Our high resolution and great spectral capabilities will enable us to probe those, neb those nebulas in ways that have not been done before. We'll be able to understand the chemistry, the temperatures, the heat flows, the mass flows, essentially the dynamics of these very interesting objects. And then finally, in the space theme that I like to call solar systems, ours and theirs, we're going to be able to interrogate every object in our solar system outside of the orbit of Mars, and additionally, examine exoplanets uh, and look for signs of life uh, and basically chemistry on those planets as well. So that's the science case. I'm going to start leading you down the engineering requirements to the design. Basically, you can summarize the characteristics of a, of a typical web target. Is it has to be anywhere in the sky. Typically, it's very far away or a small angular subtense. So I also need good resolution for exoplanets and detailed studies in general. These are typically faint. Certainly, the early universe objects have never been seen, so they haven't been detected. So we don't actually know how bright they are, but we have an idea. So we need large light collection, and our targets are in the infrared. They're either highly red shifted because they're these early universe objects that are receding from us at a great speed, so even their visible and ultraviolet light is shifted into the infrared, or they're intrinsically infrared. The light from molecules, the, uh, the signals from the protoplanetary then, so the driving issues for the web design is we have to build a cold telescope. We're talking about how cold. It has to be a large aperture. It has to be stable. When I mean stable, I mean the entire structure, which is larger than this room, has to be stable to a few tens of nanometers. I have to be able to point it. Canadians supplied instrument is the last chain in this exquisite pointing arrangement that enables a uh, web telescope to point to, to a handful of nanoradians and stare at a target. And finally, because this is a, a one of a kind opportunity, I have to have high reliability and long life. I want to deliver an excellent product to my customer and have them happy so that he absolutely wants to come back. So the design response is as you see. Uh, 
what you see is, is, a, is a segmented telescope. It's six and a half meters in diameter, so it's considerably larger than the width of this room. The sun shield, a large hexagonal structure, essentially provides a deep dark shadow into which the telescope resides, i.e. we're bringing night with us. That's the size of a devil's tennis court, approximately 22 meters long, 15, 18 meters wide. And with, in this perspective, it's a little hard to see, but it's actually about five meters from the bottom here to the top of the aft section. It's really quite an impressively large structure. You'll see that in a moment. Uh, it is the scientific successor to both the Hubble and the Spitzer Space Telescope. That's two of the four NASA great observatories built in the 80s uh, up until 2000. The other two members of that set, the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory and the Chandra X-ray Observatory, were built at our shop. So we're building the successor uh, to the two great observatories we, we had no role in. Uh, we have four instruments. They reach across the spectrum from approximately half micron, where gold cuts off to the mid-infrared at about 28, 29 microns. The telescope itself is passively cooled to 50 Kelvin. It's actually a little bit colder than that. It orbits around the Sun-Earth L2 point. And uh, as I said in the panel discussion, is, is named for the NASA administrator that provided over the golden age not only of NASA's manned space flight trip to the moon, 1961 to 1968, but also oversaw 75 science missions in that same tenure. It's quite quite a level of productivity. So the Webb's mirror is seven times the collecting area of Hubble. Uh, we need that both to detect the faint early universe objects that are our primary goal, and also to resolve them from the foreground stars. But this really isn't all of the story. And I want to weave the word in innovation, even though I haven't used it explicitly. The Hubble telescope itself is the heaviest object launched by the space shuttle. It's approximately 11.1 .1 metric tons. If we had used the same technologies and scaled up our satellite to achieve its scientific mission, I know you're all doing the mathematics, it's 81,000 kilograms, 81 metric tons. I'd have a really hard time getting it out of my factory, much less off the ground. So a, a radical set of thinking was required, and our design is approximately half the weight of Hubble with seven times the area, 7.3 if you want to be precise about it. This is roughly a factor of 15 increase in efficiency in delivering aperture to orbit. Part of, part of our mission is to, is to detect these faint infrared objects. So I don't want to have the typical scene that I have in my home on the outskirts of Los Angeles, where I can barely see my favorite North Sky constellation, Orion. I want to see the sky, and I want my telescope to see the sky as it truly is on the left. In this case, the light pollution is not from the environments of my home city, it would be driven by the self-radiation of our mirrors. So basically, to, to drive this point home, all objects at finite temperature emit light. All, all physics students learn this. This is the so-called black body or Planck function. It's the foundation of modern physics. And so again, in order to see our faint targets, we don't want to be blinded by our own light. So in order to make this point clear, I'm going to show you picture of one of my favorite objects in the universe. This is my cat, Orion. And that is his name, by the way. And that scene is seen in visible light. If we were to look at him in the infrared, where he's warmer and less insulated, we have a brighter image. And if you want to be a little bit quantitative here in the corner, I have calculated the plot function. The red curve here is for 20 micron radiation, which is well within our band. And you can see it rapidly departing from uh, the horizontal axis around 45 or 47 Kelvin. Getting the observatory cold and keeping it cold is the driving factor in JWST's design. Additionally, 
part of that design, part of the innovative thinking, if you will, is not only the sun shield and the need to have the system cold, but also the orbit. The orbit contributes significantly to our system level performance. We're going to orbit around the L2 point. You can see in this animation that the five Lagrange points which exist in the plane of the Earth's orbit around the Sun orbit synchronously. The synchronicity gives us a lot of advantages. Not only does it get us away from the heat that radiated from the Earth, but enables us to put the Sun, the Earth, and the Moon on one side of the Sun shield in height. Right? I'm not going to be able to detect the faint objects I have to if I've got the Moon full moon on one side and the earth on the other. I should hasten to add when I talk about faint objects, roughly speaking from one of these early universe objects we collect one photon per second with that enormous mirror. So turning up other lights, getting away from these other sources is an absolutely integral part of the mission design. I should also hasten to add that our orbit has no eclipses from the earth or moon, either umbral or penumbral. We're still relatively close in terms of communication, so we can have high bandwidth. We have to get the equivalent of uh, 80 high-def movies down twice a day, 390 gigabytes or thereabouts. Uh, we don't want to be too far away. Disadvantage is the L2 orbit isn't stable, so we have to do station keeping. The advantage is it does not accumulate natural debris. And finally, we also, because of this orbit, we get many launch opportunities per year. So as I said before, we're not at L2. We're hanging around in kind of a lazy oval about 500 by 800,000 kilometers so we can stay out of that eclipse zone. This gives us the ability to keep the spacecraft in sunlight at all times. And the only time the mission requires a battery is from when we go out house power at the launch site in French Guiana to approximately three minutes after separation when we get the solar array out. So we have actually a very small, a small battery. This is not usual for us. We usually have to plan for more proximate Earth missions and, and battery sizing is a key feature. Sun Shield is unique. In order to get Webb cold, we have to use a passive approach. The Spitzer Space Telescope, one of our predecessors, was cooled by putting the telescope in the doer with cryogen. The Spitzer primary mirror is about 90 centimeters. I couldn't even conceive of a doer large enough to put this telescope in. And again, even if I could, I don't think I could get it off. <coughs> so again, we had to, to innovate, if you will. In some respects, some people might call it innovation. Some people might call it an obvious conclusion. Potato, potato. We have to get the mission to work. We take the approximately quarter million watts of incident sunlight and attenuate it basically to a watt plus. I should also add that as we point over the field of regard to access the entire sky, the amount of radiation, the change in radiation to the telescope is on the order of 150 milliwatts, basically nothing. So this is highly insulating. It's essentially attitude independent. That's necessary because we have to be able to look without correcting the wave front for up to 10 days. And here what you see is a, is a picture of a construction of the limiting shadow. The pyramidal uh, shadow volume that must cover the telescope at all attitudes. So I'm going to now tell you how the sun shield enables us to see the entire sky. One of our requirements is we have to be able to see around the ecliptic poles at all times. Five degrees around them, those are pretty scientifically interesting. They're outside of the, the, the galaxy's plane. They contain a lot of early universe information. It's also where predecessor missions have looked, so we can build on that, on that science. So we have to, to tip forward. And what you should see here is that the shadow just clears the secondary mirror mount. We have a requirement from our customer that says we want to see at least 35% of the sky at any one given time, and that's what drives the need to look back 
45 degrees from that sunlight. We can spin around it. So if you imagine the celestial sphere and this band, light blue, I need to work on feeding a better orbit. There should be a light blue band that's not projecting here. And that's slide. Uh, this is the instantaneous field of regard. It's where we can point the telescope. Still keep it in the shadow, keep it stable, leave it pointed for up to 10 days if our customer so desires. Our requirement is 35%, it's roughly 40% of the sky. Now how do I go from 40% of the sky to 100% of the sky? Uh, hopefully. And the idea here is that we exploit the fact that the sun, the earth is going around the sun and we're going around the rock. So what you see here, what looks like the halo around the earth, is the representation of our, our large loopy orbit. And what you're seeing up here represented in white was what I used to, what I just showed you previously as the, the light blue band. And you're viewing down from the ecliptic pole and viewing down from the from the ecliptic equator, and now you can see the field of regard sweeping out the entire sky into the year. The sun shield is so large that we cannot put the flight sun shield in a test chamber and prove that it works. So another innovation, if you will, I'll call it a necessity is to come up with a proper means of verifying the performance of our sun shield thermally, optically, and reliability that we can unfold it. So back in 2010, we built a one-third scale sun shield. There's nothing magic about one-third. That was the biggest chamber that we had. It's an old story about uh, my, my grandmother used to cut the brisket and put it in the pot. At one point, when she was young, I said, "Grandma, why, you know, Mom, why do you cut the brisket?" She said, "When I married your your father, we didn't have a, a pot big enough to put the brisket in, so I always cut it and never changed it." So the one third scale here is, is our largest chamber. It's still 22 feet. It is it is a very significant test article. We demonstrated adequate performance. And we also demonstrated the ability to predict what was going to go on in the system in terms of temperatures at all points in the sunshine. Now what you're going to see here is a time-lapse movie of the first ground deployment of five-layer sunshine. So this is an engineering model. See the mid moons being pulled out. The layers are on top of each other as they would be in flight. And what you see from this view is the gradual uh, actuation of the tensioning system. This is actually done by hand crank on the ground. This will obviously be done by a motor. But we didn't have any volunteers for that one way trip. But <laughs> turn the crank on the way up, although I have some people I'd like to send. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, not really just kidding, I like to laugh out of that line. Uh, and so, you know, basically this is the result of do literally dozens and dozens of lower level tests and component assembly, subsystem, and, and higher levels of integration. We're in the midst of repeating this test with a more, even as I speak, with a more light more flight-like representation of what we call the core, the very center region where the uh, membranes interface to the, to the spacecraft. And then finally, what I want to show you here is a video of our deployment sequence to give you an idea of what's going to happen and how you get a by 15 by 12 meter spacecraft in a typical five meter fairing and get it out again. So here we are, just having separated 
a white ring around planet Earth is the Hubble orbit. Probably can't see it. It's touching the, it's touching the Earth. Uh, it's it's over resolved. There aren't enough pixels between the Earth and the Moon to properly represent it. But but you get you get the idea that the Hubble is very close to Earth. The geosynchronous orbit. We're a good fraction of the way out out to the Moon. You'll notice we're not deployed. Part of our mission design is to only need to add energy. There is no ability to retro or slow down. Once we get the sunny side of the spacecraft in the sun, we leave it there. The telescope starts cooling down. It's not designed to be in the sun. We don't put it in the sun. So we figured out if we get a three sigma ride out of Arion, our launch provider, we need to add no delta V. If we get a nominal ride, we have to add so much and so forth. This is the manned altitude record. This is as far as man has been from the planet. Uh, history of our species, we still have not deployed. I always like to remind my team where we're going, help isn't coming. We absolutely, positively have to get it right the first time. So that's why we test and retest and retest again. Sun Shield deploys first. Membranes themselves are folded into large structures that we call pallets and restrained for launch and properly vented so that the, the trapped air at the launch site can exit. We don't we don't have a we don't have an overpressure situation. The telescope, which is stowed on the spacecraft to manage loads and launch deploys. This is about a meter and a quarter deployment. Membranes themselves are covered to protect them during the launch sequence. Here's, here's a very interesting challenge. Typical spacecraft have a cold side to get rid of their heat. We can't dump our heat. Oh, I told you I wanted to keep the telescope an engineer practically at absolute zero. That's not a direction I have to bend heat. I have to put radiator shades to protect my, my side radiators from the IR backload from the sun shield. Not a typical spacecraft problem. Here's the tensioning that you saw take place in the factory. This is the, the animation of the motor control. This takes place about a week into the mission. <coughs> the momentum flap. This was added to the mission so that we could commit to the Sun Shield design before we knew the final mass properties. As JW goes through its uh, series of observation, it presents different uh, areas and different center of pressure to the sun. Separation of the center of pressure and center of gravity results in a torque that wants to turn the spacecraft over. We react that with the reaction wheels. Eventually, we have to use propellant to unload those wheels. But that propellant is our one life limiting measure, so we want to do that balancing as best as we can. The second cord fold wing folds up. We're about two weeks into the mission. Correction, tiny little correction to get us into the right, uh, right direction. This happens about 29 days into the into the mission. I should hasten that the, the observatory is still too warm to take meaningful data, so we have not begun the wavefront sensing and control. So in some sense, we haven't finished deploying the telescope to the final position. Our goal is to take that. 18 segment mirror and make it one optical surface, which means we have to line it up again to that handful of tens of nanometers. So that takes place about day 35, day, starting at day 44. Okay. So, in summary, 
the, the Webb telescope will achieve its mission requirements and give mankind its first look at this first stars and galaxies in the universe. This kind of first look, this revealing of the cosmic curtain, I don't think can be overplayed. Uh, the analogy I like to use is when Galileo took his cutting edge telescope, like he did not invent the telescope, he just made it better, and pointed it to the sky, innovated, if you will, revealed that the universe was fundamentally different than, than everybody thought. The Milky Way was full of stars, the sun had spots, etc. This will do the same thing for our understanding of gravity, the mass distribution in the initial universe, <coughs> the role of dark energy, the role of dark matter. We are at the end of the design phase. We are quite close to launch in October of 2018, the beginning of integration and test. And on a personal note, working this mission is really a job of a lifetime. It uses every engineering and soft skill muscle I ever had, want to have, will ever have. It's kind of an all-in, so I like to say it's a real lifestyle job. So it's a 24-7, I'm always thinking about it. And the best part about it is all of my teammates, Northrop, government, Canada, Europe, are doing the same thing. And so it's, it's really uh, an experience just, just on that basis alone. And then when you add what our mission is on top of it, it's, it's, a, it's a breathtaking opportunity that I'm grateful to all the time. I'm also grateful to you for your careful time and attention, and I'm ready for any questions. Does Orion answer? Yes, he does. Okay. Sometimes he has been known to correct me on occasion. Yes? So you need, to, you need to get one photon per second of what you want to look at. How do you get rid of the other photons that are coming in? Let's see. This is one, one photon. We are making an image. So the other noise photons from the zodiacal light and other sources are spread out over the focal point. So it's really by by forming the image that we collect that one photon a second. So we have to stare and make sure that they all fall in the same pile so that we can associate them. So that's what drives the pointing and the resolution. Could you talk about the instrumentation that's on the telescope, uh, infrared or other types? Yes. We have four instruments. They're, they're all infrared instruments of, of various flavors, three of which what we refer to as the short wave suite, roughly um, the short wave up to about 8 to 10 microns. They are uh, passively cooled, operating at about 40 Kelvin, one of which is the point guidance sensor. <coughs> I'll just change the name, I don't remember. It's a non imaging <coughs> spectrometer that's supplied by Comdev, which is the CSA contribution. That helps us do uh, the ex exquisite pointing. There is a near infrared camera, near, oh, near CAM, provided by the University of Arizona, their, their industrial partner is Lockheed. That's the workhorse camera, the workhorse uh, wavefront sensing instrument. Near spec is a European contribution, it's an integral field spectrometer, it has the ability to take spectra of hundreds of objects at the same time. This is necessary to understand. The assembly of galaxies and essentially isolate uh, our, our early universe objects. Part of the challenge of doing these early universe objects is imagine going to a forest and the tree you want to look at is way in the back. There's all kinds of other trees in front of it. You have to separate them. The way we separate the, the young or nearer objects from the ones that are further away is by color and ultimately by spectrum. So you need to have an instrument that's purposely designed uh, to do that. We also have an actively cooled instrument that's provided partly by the Europeans and partly by, by NASA. That's the mid infrared Im imager spectrometer, so-called MIRI instrument. That focal plane is, is cooled with closed-loop helium refrigerator to, to 6 Kelvin. That basically gives us our performance from 10 to 30. Great example of space system design in action, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, just very quickly, what is, the, what is the type of design margin you had on the requirements uh, in terms of long duration of the project, the cost, the, your launch well, schedule is difficult and you had multiple opportunities, but in terms of your actual design. Let's see. Let's see. Let me see if I can give you an intelligent answer to that. Good question. Uh, we 
literally have thousands of requirements. Um, unlike uh, kids, right? Some are, some are our customers' more favorites. So there's probably about 30 or 40 high visibility requirements, things like wavefront, transmission in various wavelengths, point spread functions, strel. Anybody in here an optical engineer? I probably just spoke horribly code. I apologize. Point spread functions, the size of the pile of photons that the telescope makes. The strel is essentially how close to theoretically perfect you can make the telescope. The two of them constrain the optical performance. Uh, we also have typical weight and, and power markings. Those are very traditional for, for spacecraft, and we have healthy we have healthy margins, actually extremely healthy for this uh, stage in the program, 10 or 11 percent on mass. Uh, similar, not quite similar numbers on, excuse me, power. Not quite similar numbers on mass. Uh, other things that we are watching, straight light and background that are kind of non-traditional. Uh, we report on them every every month, green, yellow, red. And so far, you know, all of our TPMs, technical performance measures, are, are basically green. Uh, so we have pretty healthy performance margins, but we're now going into the to the building phase. So we're going to start moving away from predictions, replacing assumed or spec properties with what we actually measure, and so that picture should evolve quite rapidly in about the next year. Okay, one last question. Yes, sir. You were talking about exoplanet resolution. Yes. You're, you're actually going to be able to get images of exoplanets? Yes. Some. To what size? Some. Basically, Jupiter, Neptune sizes that are sufficiently far away. We're not, we're, we're an early universe, not a planet finder. But there are coronagraphic masks on several of the instruments. There are other types of masks that will allow for uh, direct imaging of exoplanets. The one thing that we will be able to do extremely well is transiting planet science. When the planet passes in front of the host star and the light comes through the atmosphere, which has been demonstrated on both Hubble and Spitzer, maybe even on the ground, I'm not quite sure of that. Uh, we will be able to do it in, in even more exquisite detail because spectroscopy like that is all about collecting lots of photons. We're going to be able to collect seven times more photons and infinitely more in the, in the bands where Hubble doesn't work, and then about 40 times more because we're that much larger than Spitzer. So my, my humble opinion is most of our transiting most of our exoplanet science will be in the realm of transiting planet science, at least as I understand how the mission will flow. Is that your question? Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you, you very John. much.